In today's session, we will continue our discussion on monopoly. So, few more aspects of monopoly uh, we have to cover in this particular segment. So, today our focus will be on that. So, if you quickly uh, remember whatever we discussed last class is, it is all about the monopoly supply curve, why there is a absence in the absence of supply curve in the monopoly. Then we discuss about the multiplant monopoly and in this case generally the monopolies produces the entire outputs to be supplied by farm in different plants uh, and all these plants are having a different cost cost of cost function. Some, cost, some plants they are operating at a lower cost and some plants they are operating at a higher cost. And also we discuss that generally how the price and output decisions are made uh, using this uh, uh, in case of typically in case of a multiplant, uh, multiplant monopolist. And uh, then we discuss about this uh, how to measure the monopoly power through different methods like we have a learner index, we have uh, cross elasticity of demand or we have the market concentration ratio or the so called uh, HHI. And then we discuss about this uh, Rothschild index and we will discuss some more, uh, more about the Rothschild index and then we will move to our next topic. And uh, after discussing this Rothschild index, uh, we will focus today on the social cost of the monopoly power. We will take a special case where there is only buyer which is just the opposite of a monopoly that is monopsony. Then we will talk about a bilateral monopoly where there is one seller and one buyer. Then we will take about some monopoly a real world evidence and then comparison between the monopoly and perfect competition. So, if you remember in the last class we discussed uh, the measurement of the monopoly of power, there are different methods that tells us and the value of that uh, through the outcome this method del they tells us that what kind of market form it is, whether it is perfect competition, whether it is monopoly or whether between the perfect competition and monopoly the monopolistic competition. So, we discuss about the learner index yesterday, we discuss about the cross elasticity of demand, we discuss about the Arfindel Hirschman index and uh, also we just introduced the Rothschild index and today we will discuss some more about the Rothschild index. Generally, uh, how this is if you look at how this decides what is the market power of the typical uh, firm. And on that basis that is decided whether what kind of market form it is, whether it is uh, competitive, whether it is monopoly or whether it is between the competitive and monopoly market structure. So, uh, uh, here the entire focus is based on uh, two notion, one when individual firm change the price others they are not changing it. So, what should be the demand curve and in the second case when individual firms they are changing the demand curve others also they are following it and on that basis we will find out the value of the index. So, we will take two demand curve, one is D D des and second one is capital D D des. Now, what is the what is the difference between this capital D D des and the small D D des? This capital D D des generally known as the proportional demand curve and why this is known as proportional demand curve? Because when one firm change the price, other firm also change the price and that is the reason you will find this demand curve is inelastic because one firm change the price, other firm change the price. So, the response to the change in the quantity demand is generally less to the uh, change in the price and this demand curve talks about the uh, case where one firm change the price and others they are not changing the price. So, this uh, generally this uh, demand curve is known as the perceived demand curve or subjective demand curve. Okay. So, this is proportional demand curve, this is subjective demand curve. Now, the essential difference between these two is one where one change one firm change the price other generally follows that and second when one firm 
is changing, others they are not following. So, when one firm is changing, other firm is also changing, we get a proportional demand curve. When one firm is changing, others they are not changing, we call it a perceived or subjective demand curve. And why this is more elastic? Because since others they are not following, any small change in the price of this firm generally affect the quantity demanded in a larger extent. Now, we will get the slope. This is the beta and this is the alpha. Now, what is alpha? Alpha is the slope of perceived demand curve and what is uh, beta? Beta is the slope of proportional demand curve. Okay. So, alpha is the slope of the perceived demand curve and beta is the slope of the proportional demand curve. So, now we know the basis of this Rothschild index 1, we, we have two, uh, two type, two kind of demand curve, one demand curve is on the basis of the, one demand curve is on the basis of the, when one firm change the price, other reacts to it, also they also change the price and second is on the basis of the proportional demand curve, which is on the basis of that, uh, when one firm change, other change it and perceive it one, when one firm change the others, they are not changing to it. So, in this case, uh, if you look at two kind of demand curve depends upon the behavior of the rivals in the firm. On that basis, we get, we got two slope value, one is with respect to the perceived demand curve and second one is the with respect to the proportional demand curve. With the help of that slope below, now we will try to construct the index and through the value of index, we need to find out what is the market power for that typical firm. So, taking that, uh, now we will come to the index and index talks about a situation where it, the value or the index, value of index or the outcome index shows how far a particular firm controls the market for a particular period. So, Rothschild index is the slope of demand curve for the of firm that is perceived demand curve upon the slope of the demand curve of the industry that is the proportional demand curve. And the value of index in case of pure monopoly it is equal to 1, in case of perfect monopoly it is equal to 0. So, in case of pure monopoly the Rothschild index is equal to annuity and in case of perfect competition this index is equal to 0. In between 0 to unity, there are number of other firms generally you will find they are into the value that ranges from 0 to 1. So, 0 talks about one extreme in case of perfect competition, 1 talks about the other extreme in case of the uh, in case of the pure monopoly. In between if the value of the index is in between 0 to 1 that donates some other kind of the uh, market structure which is not strictly pure, pure monopoly or which is not strictly pure perfect competition. So, generally this method whether it is Rothschild index, whether it is learner index, whether it is HHI or whether it is cross elasticity of demand, generally the main motive to study this is to identify through a value, identify through a index what is the market power of that specific firm. Then we will move to the next topic, uh, the social cost of monopoly power we know that all the firms they are in the market, uh, monopoly firm when they are in the different industry or the different sector, they are getting benefit for, to the for themselves. The question comes from the what is the cost or what is the benefit that comes to the society, because obviously, if monopolists they are not getting profit, they will be not, they will not be there in the market in the long run, but what is the consequence on the society, what is the consequence on the consumer group, what is the cons uh, benefit that comes to the society, if at all they are getting it. So, monopoly power results in higher prices and lower quantity, it is inelastic because there is no close substitute and they are the price maker. However, whether monopoly power make the consumer better off or worse off for both the consumer producer, that we can uh, generally compare to the producer and consumer surplus when the competitive market or in a monopolistic market. What is the consumer surplus and producer surplus in the monopolistic market and what is the consumer surplus and producer surplus in the 
competitive market that gives us the difference between the uh, what whether the consumer they are better off or worse off, whether the producer they are better off or worse off in case of a monopoly market structure. So, if you look at in case of uh, perfectly competitive firm, the firm they produce at a point where marginal cost is equal to D or marginal cost is equal to the price and how we get the price that is from the uh, demand and supply forces of the market. Whereas, monopoly produce where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost and getting their price from the demand curve that is price and the quantity. The loss in the consumer when going to the perfect competition to the monopoly, because in case of monopoly the P is always greater than marginal cost and this leads to a deadweight loss which generally created through the monopoly. So, in competitive market firm produce where P is equal to M C and since P is equal to M B that is willingness to buy and M C is the willingness to sell. P is equal to M C which is also equal to M B is equal to M C and this in this case the consumer get the maximum total surplus. And what happens in case of monopoly? In case of monopoly P is greater than marginal revenue or P is greater than marginal cost or we can say since we are saying this is also the marginal benefit, the marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost. So, output falls short of efficient amount and that leads to the deadweight welfare loss. So, we need to know now whether if they are charging a price which is more than which is more than the uh, charging price which is more than the marginal cost whether the consumer at all getting a consumer surplus or the because of the increase in the price the quantity demanded decreases and neither that goes to the consumer pocket or nor that goes to the producer pocket and in general that goes to a deadweight loss whether rather it is a uh, rather it is a part of the profit of the consumer or part of the profit of the producer. So, now we will understand this graphically what is the deadweight loss and where generally the efficiency of the monopoly comes because if it is getting deadweight loss obviously, the monopoly is not efficient at least from the societal point of view. And if the inefficiency comes, inefficiency comes basically from the deadweight loss. So, we will say what should be the ideal condition for efficiency in case of a monopoly market and also we will see inefficiency that is through the deadweight loss. So, to understand this uh, uh, efficient level of output or what is the efficiency of the monopoly, we will take the help of the uh, uh, marginal cost and demand. we have demand curve and what is this demand curve? This is generally the benefit or the value to the buyer, this is the marginal cost, this is the ideally this should is the efficient quantity what the monopolist should produce okay, or the monopolist should sell to the buyers. Now, if you look at this M C is nothing but this from year to year if you look at this is nothing but the cost to monopolist and here if you look at this is nothing but the value to buyer. Okay. Corresponding to this, what is this? This is cost again this we can say as the cost to monopolist and here we can say again this is value to buyer. Okay. Because this and how we are identifying this value to buyer and cost to monopolist that is on the basis of the marginal cost and on the basis of the demand curve. Now, in this segment 
we have two segment now this should be the efficient quantity and we have two segment with respect to this one which is before the efficient quantity and one which is beyond the efficient quantity. Now, what happens in case of both this situation? So, if you take this graph again, this is our demand curve, this is the value to the buyer, this is the marginal cost, this is nothing but the cost to the monopolist. So, we can say that this is the efficient quantity and here this segment if you look at now what is the significance of uh, this segment the value to buyer buyer is greater than cost to seller okay cost to seller because the demand curve is lying above the marginal cost curve and what happens in this segment in this segment the value to buyer is less than cost to seller okay so efficient quantity is this before this efficient quantity the value to buyer is greater than cost to seller. So, obviously, monopolist is not going to operate here. Here the value to buyer is less than cost to seller. So, if you look at this is the profitable point for the monopolist, but ideally what is the efficient quantity? The efficient quantity or the efficient level of the output where the marginal cost is intersecting the demand curve. But what happens in practice? does the uh, monopolist generally follow a uh, efficient level of output or not that we will see because there is always a debate because uh, efficiency there is a inefficiency in the uh, level of output and that is how the firm get the dead weight loss. So, next we will see what is the inefficient of monopoly or how generally they get the dead weight loss. And how we will find out this inefficient of uh, inefficiency of the monopoly or inefficient of the monopoly output? Again, we will take the help of the demand curve and the MC curve. So, this is our demand curve, this is our marginal revenue curve, this is the marginal cost curve. Now, what is the monopoly quantity? Monopoly quantity is this because this is we follow a marginalist principle to generally uh, find out the monopoly output that is M c is equal to M r and corresponding to that we get the output level which is the monopoly output level and this is the monopoly price. Now, what is the efficient quantity? Efficient quantity is ideally corresponding to the demand curve and the marginal cost curve. So, this is efficient quantity, this is monopoly quantity. So, the difference between this monopoly quantity and the efficient quantity is generally known as the dead weight loss and this is the cost to the society in the form of the dead weight loss. Monopolists are not operating at the efficient level of output and that leads to the fact that there is a cost to the society and what is the cost to the society? The cost to the society is in the form of the dead weight loss and why there is why the dead weight loss comes into picture or why there is a evidence of dead weight loss in case of monopoly because the difference between the efficient quantity and the monopoly quantity and monopoly quantity if you look at it is always the lower quantity and higher price and efficiency quantity is one where there is a uh, when there is a higher quantity at a lower price. So, some amount of inefficiency is there or some amount of inefficient with respect to output with respect to price is there and that generally brings a social cost or that generally impose a cost on the society. 
So, if you look at the profit, it is not strictly the social cost because firms they are operating the market, they have to get some amount of profit at least in order to survive in the market, in order to produce the product and sell it in the market or cater the need of the consumer. Then from where generally the social cost comes, whether it is strictly from the profit of the monopolist or from the any other sources. So, monopolist profit is not usually a social cost, but transfer of surplus from consumer to producer. So, if you remember in case of uh, consumer surplus, whenever there is an increase in the price, the whatever the loss in the consumer's part goes to the producer. So, in this case, it is not directly coming to the, the social cost is not directly coming from the monopoly profit or the profit is not usually a social cost, but a transfer of surplus from consumer to producer generally a transfer uh, uh, generally a social cost because it takes out the surplus from the consumer and goes to the producer account. Profit can be a social cost if extra cost are incurred to maintain it such as political lobbying or if the lack of competition lead to cost are not being minimized. So, whether it is a political, lo political lobbying or if it is a lack of competition for that if there is some extra cost are incurred then only profit is generally considered as the social cost because to get profit there is some amount of extra cost involved over here. So, social cost of monopoly is uh, if you look at it, it is always likely to exceed the deadweight loss and why this uh, generally exceed the deadweight loss may be rent seekage because firm may spend to gain monopoly law uh, monopoly power as we discussed in the previous slide because the there is some additional cost involved in the in order to get the profit and that is the reason the social cost may be exceeding the deadweight loss. So, firm may uh, spend to gain monopoly power through lobbying through advertising and through building the access capacity. So, the incentive to engage in monopoly practices is determined by the profit to be gained. So, more profit may be the incentive is more and to get engaged in the monopoly practices, but the larger the transfer from consumer to the firm, the larger the social cost of monopoly. So, it is two uh, dimension one more is the profit the firm gets into more kind of uh, activity to become more kind of practice to become the monopolist or the so called the monopolization or the act of monopoly through which generally they try to get the market power. And second, how they get more profit when the transfer get produced from the transfer gets from the consumer surplus to producer surplus and this is nothing but that whenever the consumer surplus get transfer into the producer surplus there is a amount of so the cost on the society. So, the larger the transfer from the consumer to the firm the larger the social cost of the monopoly. Now, what is the regulation of monopoly power? Maybe the, the uh, regulations are many, but if you look at there is antitrust legislation, which is generally for the firm who is getting into the act of the monopolization. Now, since we know that monopoly power is something which is imposing a cost on the society, there the public policy comes into picture up to how much quantity or up to how much uh, limit at least the monopoly power of the firm can get control. So, generally through one of it is generally the antitrust uh, legislation or antitrust law which attempts to increase the competition through the legislation and whenever there is an increase in the competition generally it takes away the monopoly power or market power from the firm. Then we have the price regulation. And in price regulation, the focus is to eliminate the deadweight loss with the monopoly. And why the deadweight loss takes place? Because monopoly charges a higher price, which reduces the demand from the consumer. And when it reduces the demand from the consumer, generally some unused, uh, there is a difference between the efficient uh, and the uh, efficient and the uh, monopoly output, which leads to deadweight loss. So, the role of the price regulation is to charge a price or to uh, do a price ceiling, which eliminate the deadweight loss of the with the monopoly. So, then we will try to understand this price regulation through this graph. So, if you look at here, there are uh, the typical uh, monopoly understanding like we have a average revenue curve, we have a 
marginal revenue curve and we have average cost curve and we have marginal cost curve. Okay. So, now if you look at the graph there are two level of output. One level of output is with respect to marginal cost and marginal revenue and other level of output if you look at it is Q 1 that is on the basis of mainly on the basis of the uh, maybe you can call it mainly on the basis of the price ceiling and when the price ceiling is done that it gives into the another quantity. Okay. So, if you look at the graph now uh, the monopolist produce Q m and charges the price P m. When the government impose a price ceiling of P 1, the firm's average and marginal revenue are constant and equal for P 1 at the output level Q 1. For larger output level, the original average and marginal revenue curve applies and new marginal revenue curve is therefore, a dark purple line if you look at and which intersect the marginal cost curve at the point Q 1. So, corresponding to P 1 if you look at what is the new marginal revenue curve, the new marginal revenue curves comes from the price ceiling that is from P 1 and which intersect the marginal cost curve at the point Q 1. So, what is the marginal cost curve? So, marginal cost curve is this and this is at Q 1. So, this part can be called as this part can be called as the new marginal revenue curve. So, monopolist produce always Q m and the charges P m that is the price monopoly price and the output level is Q m, but when the price ceiling is imposed the price ceiling if it is imposed you will find that the quantity is Q 1 and the price is P 1 and for the larger output level the original uh, and original average and marginal revenue curve apply, but for the new marginal revenue curve is therefore, a dark purple line typically this line this line which intersect the marginal cost curve at Q 1. So, now if the price is lowered, so this is the P m is the price of monopoly price, P 1 is the ceiling price. When price is lower to P c at the point where marginal cost intersect the average revenue, average revenue and marginal cost intersect the average revenue here corresponding to we get a price that is P c and output increase to its maximum that is Q c. This is the output that would be produced by the Competitive, indu competitive industry because this level of output is generally through the competitive industry and competitive industry is one where you follow the when we find out what is the equilibrium price and quantity we follow a principle where P is equal to M C and at this point P is equal to M C corresponding to the, that we get the Q C level of output and we get the price which is P C P C that is or we can alternately call it as a P 2. Lowering the price further that is P 3, it reduces the output to Q 3 and causes shortage. So, again if you reduces the price to P 3 that will cause a shortage to the uh, shortage that is Q 3 by Q 3 days and marginal revenue curve when price is regulated to be no higher than P 1. Now, what is the regulation over here? If you look at the regulation here is that when we are going on decreasing the price when we are going on decreasing the price one is monopoly price then the ceiling price is imposed that again reduces the increase the output level from Q m to Q 1 and the price is from P m to P 1. But the ideal is still there is some amount of the gap between the competitive price and the uh, ceiling price. So, still that amount of dead weight loss is still there with the monopoly. If the price reduces below this mono competitive price, generally this reduces the output to Q 3 and uh, cause a shortage that is Q 3 by Q 3 days. So, this is again not profitable for the monopolist if the through regulation if you are reducing the price which is even lower than the 
competitive price. So, here regulation works in the form of a ceiling price that somehow increases the somehow increases the output beyond the monopoly output and reduces the price below the uh, monopoly price. So, that somehow some amount of the dead weight loss can be controlled through the regulation. Now, we will see how the regulation work in case of a natural monopoly and what is natural monopoly here? Natural monopoly is here where uh, the one firm generally they have generated a economies of scale and they are producing in such a cost effective manner or at a lower average cost of production that reduces the that uh, reduces the scope for the other firms to enter into the market and operate. So, regulation uh, when it comes to regulation in the case of the natural monopolies, generally this PMC does not work with the extensive economies of scale. So, regulated firms have very little incent incentive to minimize the cost. Now, what is this P by M C? P by M C whenever we P is equal to M C whenever we talk about this, this is the case of a competitive economy. So, since uh, when it comes to regulation in the natural monopoly, this P is equal to M C does not work with the extensive economies of scale and natural economy natural monopoly is a market where there is more economies of scale and that in that generally creates a barrier for the other firms to enter. But when it comes to regulation, still regulated firms have very little incentive to minimize the cost and uh, but when you are uh, incentive to minimize the cost at least the some amount of the output can be controlled when it comes to the regulation. So, next we will see how the regulation work in case or how the price regulation in case of the uh, natural monopoly and whether it affect the deadweight loss or whether it also reduces the social cost of the production. So, we have average revenue curve, we have marginal revenue curve, then we have average cost and why the shape of average cost is like this because this is a case of natural monopoly and the firm is operating at the lower average cost and we have marginal cost. Corresponding to uh, this point that is M C and M R, we get the quantity and price. So, price is P m, quantity is Q m and what is the ceiling price here? If you want to make it a um, uh, some if you want to make or if the policy wants to do some regulation with that, they will support a price where P is equal to uh, A c or A r is equal to A c and if you do this then we get a price that is P r that is the regulated price. And what is our competitive price? Competitive price is that point where A r is equal to M c. So, A r is equal to M c is perfectly competitive price. So, we have three level of output, three level of price. We have we have monopoly output, we have regulated output and we have competitive output, we have monopoly price, we have regulatory price and we have competitive price. So, if it is unregulated, if there is no regulation, then the monopoly should produce Q m and charge P m. If the price were to regulate and be uh, the price that is the firm would lose money and go out of the business cannot cover the average cost. So, if you can ask the monopoly to produce at the price P c which is competitive price uh, and produce the level Q c, generally monopoly would go out of the business because they will lose money and it will not cover the average cost also. So, as a regulator generally the regulator will fix the price at P r giving profit as large as possible without going out of the business and that also reduces the dead weight lost associated with the uh, associated with the monopoly. So, what is the motive behind this price regulation in case of natural monopoly? 
even if the regulator is not forcing the monopolist to use the competitive price or competitive level of output, at least they are giving a regulated price which is above the competitive price and below the monopoly price. And if the monopolist through regulation, if they have to follow it, still they are getting some amount of profit and they are not out of the business. And in other way, it also controls the dead weight loss and brings down or redu reduces down the social cost associated with the monopoly power or social cost associated with the monopoly's profit. Now, what is the difficulty when it comes to regulation? Till the time there is a uh, good estimation of demand and cost that uh, generally uh, helps in regulating the price, but there is always a difficulty in estimate the firm's cost and demand function because they change with evolving market condition. It is not that the cost and demand function is constant, generally they change with evolving the market condition. So, that leads to the need of a alternative pricing technique and what is the alternative pricing technique? The rate of return regulation allows the firm to set a maximum price based on the expected rate of return that the firm will earn. So, the rate of return regulation uh, is the alternative pricing technique in order to understand, uh, in order to capture the dynamics in the demand and cost function. And it allows the firm to set a maximum price based on the expected rate of return that the firm will earn. So, here the firm which suppose they, they can, uh, they can do a prediction that what is the uh, rate of return they will earn once they, they pre fix up the price at this level. And here the rate of return uh, uh, method generally the firm is allowed to choose a higher price which will give them the maximum profit. But here if you look at it is still not the free of challenges, still there is challenges in this uh, method also this rate of return, but still it has emerged as an alternative pricing technique looking into the change in the demand and cost function. So, Apart from this rate of, uh, rate of return techniques, government can also set up a price cap that typically the ceiling price like uh, we discussed just now based on firms variable cost, past prices, possible infl inflation and productivity growth. So, here when the uh, government is setting a price cap or they are doing a price ceiling, it is not uh, may be on the basis of the competitive price or the monopoly price rather here some other variable is taken into consideration like uh, the what is the firm's variable cost like what is the average variable cost at what rate the uh, scale of operation is increasing. Their previous what is the price records the possible inflation and the productivity growth and a firm is typically allowed to raise its price each year without the approval of regulatory agency by amount equal to the inflation minus expected productivity growth. So, even if uh, the regulation is there, still there is some amount of freedom to the firm when it comes to increasing the price and they can increase the price each year with the approval from the regulatory agency by amount equal to the inflation minus the expected productivity growth. So, the, uh, the gap between the inflation and the expected productivity growth that is the amount what they can raise through the uh, through the increase in the price that is each year and for that they do not need the regulators approval. Then we will uh, start a new kind of uh, market where it is uh, the uh, so, till now if you look at it is about how many sellers or how many buyers. So, here we will specifically talk only about the more from the buyer perspective because this is a market structure or this is a form of market which is a subset of the monopoly or kind of monopoly where it is market with a single buyer. So, till the time we have the understanding that monopoly is the market where there is only single seller, but monospony is a market which there is a single buyer and a monospanist cannot purchase unlimited amount of an input at uniform price even if it is the single buyer. And here the monospony market is more into the input pricing rather than the product pricing and this monospony, the evidence of monospony can be found more in the input market rather than the product market. So, this is a market with, with a single buyer it cannot purchase unlimited amount of an input and uniform price. The price which the monospanist must pay each quantity purchase given by the market supply curve for the inputs. So, whatever the price he pay 
for each quantity it has to be the market on the basis of the market supply curve for the inputs. And since the market supply curve for the most inputs are positively slope, slope the price that monosodium must pay is generally an increasing function of quantity he purchase. So, since the supply curve is positively slope the price what he is paying that is also an increasing function of quantity he purchase. And generally we take a case of the monopolist which describe an employer with a monopolist buying power of the labor. So, here the firms employment constitute a large portion of the total employment of labor and we assume that, that this type of labor is relatively immobile. Farm is the wage maker in the sense that wage rate it has to pay very directly with the number of worker it is employ. So, they are not the wage taker they are the wage maker and whatever the wage rate, wage rate they are paying to the labor that generally varies with the number of worker it is employ and the employment constitute a large number of uh, a large number of large portion of the total employment of the labor then only they can influence it. So, even if they are the single buyer at least they are capturing um, uh, majority share of the labor market then only they can considering as they can consider as the single buyer or they can consider as the monosponist. So, sometimes this monospotic power of the employer is virtually complete because there is one major employer in the labor market and in this case they generally enjoy the uh, generally enjoy the maximum uh, mono, monospotic power because they are the single buyer or they are also capturing the majority market share of the typical input. So, suppose if you look at uh, we take a example that how generally this cost changes in case of a monosony and how we get the equilibrium in case of a monosony market. We will just take a small example to understand this. Suppose a farm is uh, using 3 units of labor at the wage rate of 60 per head and how much total factor of when they are hiring 3 uh, unit of labor with a wage rate of 60 that comes to 180. If additional unit of labor is required the firm has to pay higher price for fourth unit that is rupees 80. Because all the uh, inputs or the all the units of input cannot be charged in a single wage rate and up to 3 units of wage rate he, they are charging 60 per head. So, the total factor cost is 180. When fourth unit is required he is charging 80 and it is not only 80 to the fourth unit also 80 rest uh, 80 to the rest of the units also rest 3 units of labor that increases the total cost from 20, 20 each for each unit of labor which increases the total factor cost to rupees 320 because this is now 80 rupees plus 4 units. So, that comes to rupees 320 uh, for the total factor cost. Now, what is the marginal factor cost? The marginal factor cost if you look at here it exceeds the price of labor because price of labor is 60 and marginal factor cost at this stage is from third unit to fourth unit is more than the price of the labor. So, now we will see how we uh, take this uh, example uh, with the help this total factor cost or marginal factor cost with the graphical explanation and how generally monospony reach the equilibrium. Okay. So, this is the marginal factor cost for labor, this is supply for labor this is marginal revenue product for labor corresponding to this we get number of laborer here we get another labor of labor that is according to the perfect competitive we get a wage rate that is with respect to a that is uh, this is W star sorry this is yes this is uh, W star 
this is W dash and this is W star. Okay. Now, what is marginal factor cost for labor here? This is each increase in the quantity of the factor, the firm use because this is a marginal factor cost with respect to the labor. Now, what is MRPL? MRPL is the demand curve for the labor and how we get the mar marginal product for labor that is MPL multiplied by price that gives us the marginal revenue product for labor. Supply curve is the supply curve for the labor. Now, what is the profit maximizing quantity? Profit maximizing quantity is the intersection of the marginal revenue product and marginal factor cost for labor. So, that gives us L star worker and pay wage rate that is W star. Now, labor receive a wage which is less than the marginal product. So, labor receive a wage which is less than the marginal product and how we find this uh, equilibrium? We find this equilibrium through uh, this uh, wage rate that is W star and labor that is L star. Now, what is this L dash? L dash is ideally what is through perfect competitive, it is a case of a perfect competitive, then the equilibrium can be found with the help of supply of labor and demand for labor. So, corresponding to that we get a label that is A which is W dash is the wage rate and L dash is the amount of labor. So, if it is a case of a if it is a case of a perfect competitive market, then ideally this should be the total amount of labor and this should be the wage rate. Any wage rate below this will generally bring the difference in the supply and demand for labor. The supply of labor will be less because this wage rate is not profitable or not beneficial from them and that is the reason if you look at the supply of labor is less than demand for labor if any wage rate below this. So, this can be called as W star uh, dash or simply w, w, w double dash which is the wage rate which is less than the W star which is the uh, monosponist uh, wage rate and this is the perfect competitive wage rate. Any wage rate below the, to that will generally brings down the labor supply and there is a gap between the labor demand and labor supply. So, in case of monosponi equilibrium, we find the equilibrium at this point where MFCL generally the marginal factor cost of labor is intersecting the marginal revenue product for the labor and we get the output that is L star is the labor output and W star is the wage that is given to them and generally labor receives a wage which is less than the marginal product for the labor. Now, we will say uh, what is the monosponi power like the way we analyze there is a market power for the monopolist whether there is any market power for the monosponist. So, monosponi power is the ability of the buyers to affect the price of the goods and pay less than the price that would exist in a competitive market. So, this is again a uh, power to give a lower price than whatever existing in the market. So, through this and when this will happen when suppose you case take a case of a place where there is only one industry existing and they are considered to the be the largest employer in this particular locality. So, if whatever the price they are charging the labor they has to accept it otherwise there is no other way out to uh, get the employment. So, this is the case where the firm or where the plants they have a market share because they can influence the price and they can pay wage, wage rate which is lower than the existing uh, wage rate in the market. So, monopsory power is the ability of the buyers to affect the price of the good and pay less the price that would exist in a competitive market. Now, on what are the factor on which the degree of monosponi power generally uh, depends? First one is the number of buyers. The fewer the number of buyers, the less elastic the supply and the greater is the monosponi power. Interaction among the buyers, the less the buyers compete, the greater the monosponi power. 
and elasticity of market supply extent to which the price is marked down below the MB depends upon the elasticity of supply facing buyer. And if the supply is very elastic, markdown will be small. The more elastic the supply, the more is the monopoly power. Now, we'll, uh, if you look at what is the social cost of the monopoly power. Here, if you look at again, we have again we have uh, one to understand the demand, another to understand the supply. Here, if you look at the shaded rectangle and the triangle shows change in the buyers and sellers surplus when moving from competitive price to the competitive price and quantity. So, this is what this uh, this triangle B is nothing but the ch change in the buyers and sellers surplus or we can call it this is the dead weight loss because this neither goes to the uh, neither goes to the buyers or nor goes to the sellers. And why we get this amount this triangle as the dead weight loss because of the competitive price that is P C and the Q C to the monosponent price and quantity that is P M and Q M. So, the difference between the P M that is the monopolist price and competitive price P C and the quantity that is quantity of uh, monosponist and quantity of perfect competitor that gives us the dead weight loss. And because both price and quantity are lower, there is an increase in the buyer surplus given the, the amount A by B. So, some amount of buyer surplus is there, but still it is not going to the uh, society, rather it is coming to the as a dead weight loss, because part of it is going to buyer and some amount is still considered as the dead weight loss. So, what is the social cost of uh, monosphony? The producer surplus fall by A plus C and there is a dead weight loss given by the triangle B C and it is more if you look at it is not B is the dead weight loss also the B plus C is the dead weight loss because of the monosphony power. So, we will continue our discussion on monopoly few more uh, kind of monopoly like a typical example of bilateral monopoly. Then we will do a comparative assessment between the monopoly and perfect competition and we will talk about a monopolistic uh, monopolistic form, a form of market which is a ideal mix of uh, both the perfect competitive market structure and monopoly somewhere lie between the monopoly market structure and the perfect competitive market structure in the next session.